Welcome to Unity Now, the podcast where we discuss unity in the face of division. Inspired by the Unity 2020 plan, we strive to unite Americans by highlighting the middle ground between the two dominant parties and promoting the individual over groups. Each episode, we will bring you exciting, well-informed guests and host nuanced conversations about politically charged subjects. Our goal is to bring an end to the ideological war threatening the collective well-being of this great country. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Unity Now and our continued mission to highlight individuals and groups with solutions to help us find common ground. I have the pleasure of sitting down with Tim Redman, uh, author, educator, and I believe a fellow drummer. Uh, right, Tim? <laughs> That's right. And, and we're going to discuss his new book, uh, Political Tribalism in America, How Hyperpartisanship Dumbs Down Democracy and How to Fix It. And there's the book. Hey, Tim. How are you? I didn't I'm doing know you well. were a drummer, Toby. <laughs> I know. I wanted to leave that for the, the start to say that, yes, I've been a drummer now for um, about 30 years. Wow. Um, uh, since I was at least 10 years old. How about you? Uh, I started, well, now I, I started when I was 15, and I'm 50 now. So there you uh, go. It, it's been a while, and um, I... It, this is completely irrelevant to the to the topic at hand. But <laughs> right. I, uh, the first I had a, a couple of friends. Uh, we all wanted to start a band, and only one of us could play an instrument. One of the guys could play guitar and and play drums, and he had a drum set, and he wanted to play guitar, and so we di we didn't even consider a bass player. Uh, but the the other two guys, myself and the other guy, we both wanted to sing, and neither of us wanted to play drums. So we had to draw straws and I drew the shortest straw and that's how I ended up having, he, and then he handed me the drumsticks and was like, there you go. And I sat behind the kit and that's, that's how my drum odyssey began by losing a, <laughs> losing a draw. That's but funny. I, I'm glad I did because I, I just love it. That's awesome. Yeah. I don't know about shortest straw. I mean, don't the drummers get all the girls, right? That's what everybody <laughs> right. says. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> all the attention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, the most I didn't... equipment to carry too. Always, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, the heaviest stuff and the most uh, the most thing to pay for, definitely. Exactly. It's expensive. Yeah. It's very expensive to be a drummer. Yeah. Yes. All right. So enough about drums. Um, we're here to talk about the book um, "Political Tribalism in America." And uh, so you've received, you received your PhD in political science from the University of Buffalo. You're an award-winning educator and author of over 100 articles on critical thinking and politics. So my first question um, is around evolution. Um, I believe studies around evolution show that as humans, uh, tend, human, humans tend to naturally form tribes, much as a, a thing of community community and uh, protection for the for the people um, so what needs to be fixed and therefore why write the book um, can you explain kind of your thought process to what led to the creation of the book sure uh, I um, well I've always had a, a real interest in politics since since high school and that's why I pursued that in college and then graduate school um, and I've also had always had a real interest in critical thinking. And so I've sort of gravitated towards where those two fields sort of connect. And what, what's most fascinating about it is really the lack of critical thought in politics. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the reason for that lack of critical thought is largely, as you were alluding to, our tribal nature. And when we talk about politics, obviously, our tribes in the United States tend to be you're in the Democratic tribe or you're in the Republican tribe. And as you spoke about, like the, you know, the humans by nature are tribal. And th though, because again, uh, as you also mentioned, it, it really helped us survive. If humans are a social mm -hmm. species and we're a social species because, you know, we, we're not particularly fast. Uh, we're not particularly great climbers. Um, we 
back back then when when we were first evolving on the savanna of africa we we were the hunted we you know um we were not the hunters and um and so our survival really depended upon living in groups and as a result of that you know we we had to find ways to work together um and live together and so part of our tribal nature is this strong affinity or affection for our in-group because uh, we to survive and to thrive we need to live amongst other humans mm -hmm. of course when you the other aspect of this tribal nature is when we come into contact with out groups and so we have our group and we have our particular territory and the resources that we can find on that on that territory but if we come into contact with another group that is coming into our territory and trying to take some of our resources that of course is a threat to our very survival and that's going to lead to some conflict and uh, that's what you see in american politics right now kind of this our tribal nature sort of playing out on the political landscape where you have democrats and republicans and there there tends to be a uh, strong affinity within each of those parties. They, of course, have disagreements like any groups do. Um, but there tends to be strong, positive emotion within that in-group. Political scientists call this affective polarization when they, there's a lot of polarization is a really complicated topic, actually. Uh, and there's different kinds of polarization, but affective polarization is essentially the feeling that you have uh, for, for your group versus the other group, the other party. And when, and political scientists measure this just by asking people, uh, they call it the thermometer scale, on zero to 100 degrees, how warmly do you feel towards members of your own party? And 50 degrees would be neutral. Uh, generally over, since they've really been measuring this since the, you know, the 1960s, 1970s, um, our, our feeling for our own party is about 70 degrees, which is very high. We, we feel warm towards members of our own party. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the flip side of that, of course, is we increasingly have negative views about members of the other party. And this is where we have seen the drastic change in American politics in the last three decades or so. Because uh, in the 1960s and the 1970s, when they asked people, how do you feel about the out group? Uh, we didn't necessarily have these negative tribal feelings towards them. It was clearly lower, uh, but it was generally members of the other party would give around a, a 50 degree rating, maybe a little bit lower in the 40s, um, but a generally neutral feeling. So I feel good about my group. I like my group. I identify with my group. The other group, eh, they're OK. I, I don't you know, feel particularly close to them or have an affection for them, but I, you know, I don't have any negative yeah. feelings towards them. But what's happened now is that that number is dropping into the 20s, uh, low 20s. And so that's where you've got this polarization because this gap has gone, you know, the affection between the different parties has gone from maybe 70 to 50 to now 70. It's not that we love our own party more. Now that's pretty much stayed consistent, but you've gone from a 70-50 split, so like a 20 degree gap, now to say a 70 to 20 to a 50 degree gap. And we feel incredibly negative and hostile towards the other party and, and attribute all these awful characteristics with the other party. And that's, that's why our politics seems so toxic uh, right now is because that, that growth and affective polarization. Okay. And so maybe if I understand you correctly, to, it's oversimplified maybe to say all polarization is bad. Um, where it's, is that kind of correct? Like it, not all polarization is bad. It's, it's kind of a natural thing as well. Well, I think, um, yeah, I mean, it, it depends, you know, uh, there's, um, there's obviously going to be political conflict. Uh, there's going to be political disagreement and that's very healthy for a democratic society. Um, you want open disagreement. You, you don't want everybody agreeing on stuff because then ideas aren't really being tested. And so you want different points of view and you want a place to explore those different points of view. And um, so uh, if, if you look at, say, 
policy polarization, where what is the gap between people's views on policy? Uh, or you look at party polarization, and sometimes the political scientists call this sorting. And this is, you know, back in the 1950s, for example, we used to have conservative Democrats and liberal Republicans. And a lot of political scientists actually argued that that, that wasn't a good thing because everything was muddled, right? You, there, there wasn't really a clear choice between parties. And um, so our party polarization has actually increased too, where, and this is where you hear people say, you know, we don't really have liberal Republicans or conservative Democrats anymore. All the conservatives have switched their party and all the, all the conservative Democrats have switched their party and now they're conservative Republicans. All the liberal Republicans have now switched their party and they become liberal Democrats. That in and of itself isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, you know, uh, the, the problem is when, I, I think the, the greater problem is that affective polarization, that hatred for the other side. I think it's good to have opposing parties with different ideas. Um, if we can have that and yet have civil conversations and discuss differences and, and try to take opposing points of view into consideration and really see what side has the better evidence on a particular you know, point of view and then actually be willing to yield to better evidence and better arguments, that's healthy. That's healthy for a democratic society. I think that the problem and the real dangerous kind of polarization is that more affective polarization where it's not just that the other side thinks different than us. They're, it's that the other side is evil, they're immoral, they're out to destroy the country, uh, they're, they're, you know, they're stupid, and so on and so forth. I think that, that is the major problem. Um, you, know, you, you can have, and people talk a lot about policy polarization, and, if, and, and that's disputed, and I actually don't, don't believe it's as polarized as people suggest um, hmm. on the issues. Okay. Uh, a lot of Americans are, are actually quite in the, towards the middle. And, yeah. uh, the, the, you know, there's, and I, I do some of these exercises with my students, and this is going to be a, a part of my next book, um, that you, you know, you ask people, what do you think the typical Republican position is on abortion or whatever? What do you think the typical Democratic position on abortion is? And people tend to overestimate how extreme uh, the other side is. And uh, so I, I don't think policy polarization is as bad as people think. Um, I don't think party polarization is necessarily in, in and of itself. It doesn't have to be a negative thing. But when you sort of add that affective polarization to it, it, it can make it pretty ugly. Now, you know, uh, to, you, it could always be the case that having policy polarization and having party polarization fosters that affective polarization. You know, mm -hmm. if there's no sort of all these folks are Democrats and all these folks are Republicans and they all have different, you know, issue positions, then it, maybe it starts to seem like, well, they're so different. That group is so different from my group. And so that can sort of bring in that affective polarization or that out party hatred. So all these things, it's complicated, and all these things could be connected in, in very complex ways. Uh, but I, I think that it's important, as I said before, to, to have some of that disagreement. I just don't think we're, we're doing so in a civil manner. Agreed. Yeah, we had um, two Braver Angels people on about a year ago, I believe, to have you know an abortion debate, basically. Mm. And... Um, we could barely hear them disagree. You know, right. mm. they were on different sides technically, but it was not like what you would believe you would hear from the left and right. Like you said, it's not oversimplified. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, most, I, you know, a lot of um, Republicans think that abortion should be allowed uh, in the first, some in the first trimester, um, a lot of them for rape, incest, you know, health of mother. And a lot of Democrats are uncomfortable with abortion late, you know, in a pregnancy. And so a lot of a lot of folks are really sort of in the middle. Um, but you would never know that by by some of the, the charged rhetoric um, that that we have on a lot of these issues. Yeah. And so that 
affective polarization charged rhetoric is there a way to a place to point to where this all began or when it started to become such a national problem in the u.s yeah it's some of these trends started in the 90s um you know and then and then continued to sort of in the 2000s uh it it's really difficult to i mean there's there's a lot of debate about you know what was the cause of this and um it preceded social media social media has probably served as an accelerant um you know and, and made it worse people talk about sort of Newt Gingrich and how he sort of changed politics and how we talk about politics. And uh, so there, there's a lot of different theories out there. And, you know, I, I, I don't know. And I'm sure it's a it's probably a mix of a whole bunch of things in it. And it sort of just then begins to snowball. Uh, but that's it, it's been it's been happening. It's been sort of developing for several decades now. Yeah. Anytime I talk to anybody in around political science, I want to ask that question to see if anybody yeah. knows. I know that's the, probably the hardest question to ask, because if you can figure out how exactly it happened, then you can figure exactly how to fix it potentially, right? So, yeah. Um, and you get back to like this is one of my next questions I had anyway. We kind of already talked about this. You state in the in the book that um, you state that the book is not an attack on political parties and that the parties do provide several important functions in our society. Um, so then can our parties exist without the tribalism and can tribalism be solved with our current two party system? Do you believe? Uh, that's a great question. Um, it's a good question. There is, uh, obviously we've, we've had two parties, um, two major parties um, throughout American history, and there's been a fluctuation, right, in how much yeah. animosity there has been between these different parties. And, you know, in the 1950s and so on, we, we had two parties, but there there wasn't as much animosity between them. But that's, again, because you didn't have the party polarization. You did have, you know, liberal um, Republicans and conservative Democrats. And so there were... The, the parties could sort of work together on different issues. Uh, I, I think one of the interesting proposals or plots that are out there uh, would would be to have more more parties. Uh, Lee Drutman has done a lot of work on this and has written about um, escaping the two what he calls the two party doom loop. And mm -hmm. um, I, I think what his central argument is if we had more parties and he would say maybe like five or six parties but just just for the sake of argument say you had a you know a, a farther left party a farther right party a center left center right and then sort of a middle party that there wouldn't be you know um or even if you let's take like a libertarian party for example yeah so for for if you had a libertarian party um you know, if the issue was abortion or, or something like that or gay marriage, mm -hmm. the Democratic Party would would want to partner with the Libertarian Party. Right. And maybe put together a coalition that that could be a governing majority or whatever to pass legislation. But then if it was something like taxes and tax cuts, well, then the Republican Party would want to be working with the Libertarian Party. Yeah. And his argument is that if you had a dynamic like that, then there would be an incentive uh, to avoid like, demonizing or dehumanizing the other party. Democrats and Republicans still wouldn't really get along, but there, you know, there would be this chunk of, of people, uh, voters and also representatives in this libertarian party or whatever. And the other parties would want to play nice with that party because you might be in opposition to them on this one particular issue, but you might need them tomorrow to pass an issue with which you uh, agree with them. Yeah. And so his argument is that could sort of reduce the toxicity in some of our politics uh, and basically make people play nice uh, with, with each other because they could be potential allies. And uh, so I, I, I do think it's an interesting thing to think about. Um, I, you know, I do think that 
we could make it work with a with a two party system. I that I might be overly naive and optimistic, uh, but I I I think that it is possible. Um, it n- not necessarily easy, but you know there are people of goodwill um, and members of the other party who are willing to work together when they can work together and. Uh, those voices tend to get drowned out um, by the more sort of extreme voices or loudest voices in the room. But I do think there are people who are willing to work together and to compromise and realize that in a democratic society, you don't always get 100% of what you want and you never will. And um, so I I think it could work. It just, it's going to require a change in mindset uh, among the electorate. It's going to have to, you know, the media is going to have to behave in a different way. Social media outlets are going to have to behave in a different way. Uh, we, my book largely focuses on, you know, that there are a lot of books out there that talk about structural changes that have to take place, whether that's changing the party system, changing our electoral process, like maybe using rank choice voting and, you know, instead of winner take all sort of first past the post systems that we have now, there's mm-hmm. people talking about changes that social media could make or uh, mainstream media outlets can make. And I think that's all important. Uh, my, my book is written for the individual citizen. What can you do today in your life to help contribute towards making our political system function better as is with within this two party system. Yeah. And my focus because of my interest in critical thinking uh, is we need to we need to take our responsibilities of citizens uh, citizenship seriously. And part of that is uh, trying our best to follow what, what's known as the folk theory of democracy as opposed to the tribal theory of democracy. And that's what I try to lay out um, throughout all of the different chapters is ways that you interact, ways that you seek information, ways that you perceive information, ways that you evaluate information, uh, how to do so in a way that is not just beholden to your political party. And it's a, it's a shift in mindset. And I've seen it happen in my, my own life, you know, my own experience. Um, I've seen it happen in other people's lives and experiences. I've I just actually mentioned Braver Angels. I attended the Braver Angels convention early in July in Gettysburg, and yeah. you see it happen there. Um, it's it, it can be done, and there are people willing to do the hard work. We just have to get that message out there and encourage people um, to start thinking and behaving differently. Uh, we can do that. And it again, it's not easy. But it's something that for for those folks who are concerned about the state of our politics right now, uh, there is something that you can do. And when you take all of those individual efforts, uh, you you can. I, I talk about I use, you know, a, you know, the ship of state and everyone kind of picking up an oar and starting to paddle yeah. uh, in, in one direction away from the tribal theory of politics towards the folk theory and. Everyone who picks up a paddle and starts, uh, you know, paddling or picks up an oar and starts paddling, uh, then that sort of builds a momentum and and we can overcome sort of the toxicity that's in our politics right now. Yeah, I think you you basically answered what was going to be my next question about being tailored for individuals. And, um, you know, if you thought that was a reasonable goal, which you you obviously do believe, um, but how do you get to all individuals then? Uh, like, I believe some of them are captured. I believe I was captured. And I, I've told this story probably too much on this podcast, but maybe you probably haven't heard it where I believe I was captured um, within the right um, being from rural Indiana and not really growing up focusing on politics at all, but un- until it was probably the worst time to focus on it from a rural place in a, a, a state that always votes red, technically. Uh, so in 2016, I was all about Trump, and we have to we have to hit you know fight Hillary, and you know I believe there was back then no way for me to be able to then get out of that bubble to then find a book like yours to then read about it and then see the the truth there basically and how to think uh, differently. Uh, until I found it myself um, a couple years after the election where um, 
it was probably a few videos on uh, YouTube. It was people like Brett Weinstein on and Jordan Peterson, and they were reasonable people that I started to hear from that would talk about and things going on in the country and say, well, if you're a Trump voter, what did that fix, right? If you were uh, voted for Hillary, you know, then what was going on with the left, you know, and things like that. And that's where I started to think differently myself. So if people are captured like that, mm -hmm. how do we get to those individuals, right? To get them to read the book or read books right. like yours, you know? Well, I, I think it's, it is tough, um, as you just said, and but w with your personal experience, you know, it's not impossible. Right. I think, um, you know, w when when politics becomes so emotional and it, and it seems to be a, become a central part of all of our lives where everything is politicized, right, that we, we feel as though we, we have to take a side and then that can kind of snowball. Uh, where we just start seeking out certain pieces of information and, and it, it biases everything. And that's, you know, what I, the, the central thesis of the book is we, we tend to think that we're, you know, looking at the issues and researching the issues and then sort of deciding on our party. We, we think that our, our thinking leads to our party, but in fact, our party determines our thinking. We have our yeah. party, um, you know, th this is a complex debate too, but you know, whether there's some genetic components there with personality or whatever, or a lot of it, I think, is socialization, our parents, our peers, our friends, our coworkers. But we have our party. And then once we have that identity, that identity completely biases the information we look for, how we perceive that information, and, and how we evaluate that information. And so once you sort of get into that, it is really, really hard to get out of it. Uh, it's not impossible. Um, people do it all the time. Uh, but I would, I would say uh, what we need um, is, I, I think a lot of what happens is sort of people who maybe haven't completely gone down that road, uh, at least all the, all the way down that road, um, a lot of times they, they'll be silent or they sort of remove themselves from political discussions and things of that nature. And this has been found. Chris Bale, who's a professor at Duke, um, he, he did some research with this on Twitter and found that you know, so much of the political content, I can't remember the, the exact number, but it's like 90 something percent of the political content is, is uh, originated by like less than 10 percent of the users. And most, most people who are viewing this content don't agree with it, but they're so intimidated and off, oftentimes rightly so from commenting on it. Because if you, you know, someone is saying something that's a little bit more extreme, whether it's to the left or to the right or whatever, or they're, you know, they're, they're saying the other side is this, the other side is that. And you try to make a comment that says, well, you know, I, maybe we shouldn't overgeneralize and claim that all Republicans are this or all Democrats are that, or I, I don't really think that Democrat, all Democrats believe that or all Republicans believe that. And then the, the response can be vitriolic. Uh, he, he gives examples in his book about, you know, people sort of chiming in and then somebody responding that they're going to inflict violence, you know, on that person or their family. And, and those people are just like, okay, I'm, I'm done. Like, what's the point of this? Yeah, and as back a result, off, yeah. you know, so many people like back off and back out. And what happens then is you just have the, the loudest, most extreme voices dominating the discussion. And that's what you see on social media a lot. That's what you see on cable news. And, the, and so we start to think that everybody's thinking that way. And, and that's why one of the other fascinating things about this is Democrats and Republicans have such skewed views of what the other party is like whether that's i i was talking about issue positions earlier we yeah. we tend to think the other party is has more extreme issue positions but it's even demographic stuff like vastly overestimating you know how much of the republican party is rich or old or how much of the democratic party is black or gay or whatever um 
we have these stereotypes of, of what the other party is like and who they are and what they look like and how they live. And, and, they're, and they're wrong and they're off or what they believe and what they think. And that's because we're, you know, stuck in these sort of distorted views of what American politics is like. And you have a lot of people hating each other when, you know, for, for reasons that aren't even necessarily accurate. And so I think if we could just, and there, and there is research that shows um, that if you can correct those um, in, in, you know, inconsistencies or you, you could correct those mistakes or, you know, stereotypes that people have and you tell people, you know, you tell a Demo uh, Democrat, actually, this is the percent of Republicans who, you know, believe that immigration is good for the country. Or this is the percentage of Republicans who think that racism is a problem in the United States. Democrats are like, oh, wow, really? I had no idea that that many Republicans thought racism is a problem or that many Republicans think immigrants help this country. Um, and it's the, you know, there's issues vice versa for, for, you know, what Democrats believe and Republicans are like, oh, I had no idea that Democrats were really actually very supportive of police and, and so on. And once you sort of correct those misunderstandings, it, they find reductions in affective polarization. And so I think if we could get that message out and, you know, I'm, I'm trying to encourage people at the individual level to start doing that, to start having conversations with people from the other party, to start to try to be more fair-minded uh, when you're talking about political issues and, uh, and how you evaluate you know, your own party uh, and your own party's information. Not that you're gonna change your view, um, not that you're going to change parties, but it can go a long way when you're having a conversation with someone to, to say, you know, I know my party doesn't have a monopoly on the truth and I'm sure they're wrong about certain things and I wanna know what your, your point of view is. Again, not that it's gonna change your mind or change your position, but uh, just to have sort of those conversations because they're important because it sort of breaks down a lot of these stereotypes and misconceptions that we have about the other side. And that I think, you know, is the approach that I'm trying to take is one conversation at a time, you know, um, seeking those conversations, working on having those conversations with your fellow citizens. And then also what you do in the quiet of your own study or your own family room or living room when you're, when you're reading information and consuming information. Um, and you, you start to change individual behavior and then you model that behavior and other people see that behavior and that starts to change the narrative and it starts to elevate some other voices and we start to hear other voices that aren't, that aren't being heard at this particular moment. Yeah, and that's, that's, a, that's a great answer and that's, that's, why I, that's why I love the last part of your title you know, where you say, and how to fix it. You're focused on solutions in the book like having a single conversation with your neighbor that you maybe think they don't believe what you believe. Right. So, you know, if you hear somebody say, well, all Democrats are this or all Republicans are this, then ask them how many of that side do you even know? Right. When's the last time you ever even had a conversation with somebody that you believe disagrees with you? Right. Like, have you actually heard that disagreement or are you seeing what you see on Twitter or Facebook or uh, media, that sort of thing? Uh, right. Which brings us to um, this question. I, I really wanted to talk to you about this and in chapter four, um, where it talks about the perception of political information. And it states the American public's perception that the mainstream news media is politically slanted is simply not substantiated by the evidence. And the largest study you cite is from 2000, the year 2000, uh, which was updated to include data from the uh, elections in 2000, 2004, 2008. And then you have a study with, uh, from 2016 with 800 participants reviewed 11,000 political articles on the internet. But when you take into account everything that has happened more recently from you know the 2020 election and situations like the Hunter Biden laptop story and COVID-19 and the follow the science narrative and the Twitter files exposing government connection and censorship across social media, do you still believe our views of media is more about perception 
than not. Yeah, um, it's we'll have to wait, you know, to um, to see what new studies, you know, reveal uh, because so much in American politics changed in 2016, you know, mm. um, and there, you know, a debate there, there was and, and continues to be a debate in, in the media about how to, how should they have covered president Trump? And when he, when he said things that weren't true, should they have fact checked that? Or are, or are you putting then your finger on the scale? You know, traditionally it's, he, he said, she said, journalism. This is what the Republican says. This is what the Democrat says. And then you leave it at that. Yeah. Um, but d- does that create a sense of false balance, false equivalency? That So these are all really, really hard topics. And th- this is the, even preceding like 2016, you know, this is the, I think the part that people find most shocking or push back against the most because it seems so counterintuitive against the narrative that that everybody hears um but up to i'll just say a couple things up to that point of of you know 2016 and we'll you know we'll see how much has changed but um you know there there was this and uh, had been for decades you know this idea that the mainstream media is biased you know um most it, this really started you know among republicans and conservatives in the 60s but it became more more common among democrats and and liberals as well as time went on the idea that well most reporters are democrats so that must skew their reporting or democrats would say well most owners are conservative and so that skews what what they want to put in their paper um but a lot of you know as you mentioned a lot of the the, the best research out there uh, says it's just not, it's not there. Um, you know, some, some might skew a little to the left from time to time, some a little bit to the right, but overall, uh, it pretty balanced. And the, um, I, I talk about in the book of ways to do this. And I, and I do this with my, my classes. Um, and I, and I was just preparing this cause I'm doing some stuff, some courses over next week. I'm, I'm doing some presentations and I, Pulled okay. stuff from the the Trump indictment, and I pull an article from the Wall Street Journal, which is supposed to be conservative. I pull stuff from Fox News website, which is supposed to be conservative, uh, and then an article from the New York Times and Washington Post, which is supposed to be liberal. And I just I just take the text. Uh, I don't do the reporters. I don't you know tell them what the source is, and I I give them the four different articles, and I ask people to tell me, can tell me which one is Fox? Tell me which one is the times Hmm. and people can't do it. Um, and when, when you, when you look through the articles and you kind of do like a, a, what political science is called content analysis. So look at sort of the words that are being used, the language that's being used. If they talk to, um, you know, so for this, it was how much is coming from how much of the indictment is quoted and then how much is Trump's response to that quoted, you know, counting the lines, how much uh, space each person or each side gets. And that's essentially what, what a lot of these studies do. And, um, you know, and they find that it's, it's pretty balanced. And so this raised like to me, Hmm. which is fascinating is well, then why, why do so many people think it's, it's biased and, um, it's a lot of it, not all of it, because some of it is biased, but a lot of it um, is is our bias. And uh, so they we, we sort of read into uh, we read bias into these articles um, and they've done a lot of you know fascinating stuff with this, too, in, in research studies where they'll just take an article that they've crafted or that they've pulled, you know, from some news outlet that's very balanced uh, and then they they give it to Republicans and then they give it to Democrats. And, you know, they ask, is this an objective article or is it biased? And you have a good amount of Republicans say that it's biased against the Republican Party. You know, there's this liberal media bias. And then you'll have a fair number of Democrats say this is biased against Democrats. It's a conservative bias. And they're reading the same article. Right. Yeah. And they're just seeing completely different things. Uh, so th- that that is part of it, because there's 
when we have an expectation to see something, we see it. So if we're constantly being told that the media has a bias, we'll find it because we're looking for it, even if it's not really there. Then there are other, other things that I, that I get into the book as well. This is more mainstream news outlets. This is not Fox News at night. This is not MSNBC at night. Um, you know, these are your mainstream newspapers and so on. Uh, your nightly news programs. Yeah. And editorials are completely different, right? Editorials are supposed to be opinionated. And so what right. I see online a lot of times is people will, they'll say like, oh, that, you know, the liberal Washington Post or the conservative Wall Street Journal, here they are again, but they, they link to an editorial. Well, that's supposed to be opinionated, right? Um, yeah. Or they look at analysis pieces, which are different. And uh, so that's, it's, it's a really fascinating and complex from a, from a psychological point of view of uh, and news consumer point of view of why people think there's more bias than there actually is. Now, again, like it, it is, it's a challenge. It's a really tough job. Um, and so for, you know, Hunter Biden in the laptop, you know, um, Republicans are, are, mad about that and the Demo the democrats are like well they spent all this time on hillary's emails right and there wasn't really much about hillary's emails and and democrats think that cost her the election right and so there's you know this and the media outlets are saying well we kind of did this thing with hillary's emails and sort of towards the election and it kind of fizzled out and so Maybe we shouldn't do this Hunter Biden thing, right? And now some of them say, well, maybe we should have done this, focus more coverage on this. It's a, it's a hard job. And there, there's going to be mistakes made all the time. And there's going to be editorial decisions that are what to include and what not to include. Uh, it's tough, right? And, um, but generally speaking, when... They've sort of tried to look at this in an objective manner. The other study you mentioned, and this isn't just necessarily like liberal professors doing this, right? This is, yeah. they, they did this with um, just users online and they gave them hundreds and hundreds of political articles to look at, stripped it of the masthead. And these folks who were reading it were like, yeah, I can't, I can't tell you if this is, you know, I, I don't see really any particular bias here. Um, and this was just voters looking at articles from Fox News, New York Times. Uh, and they, you know, when you sort of strip out those markets, but when we see New York Times, we're like, it's going to be liberal. When we see, you know, Wall Street Journal, like, well, this is going to be conservative. And then so we sort of pick up on those things. Uh, but, you know, 2016, mm -hmm. it, it, so I'm interested to see what some of the research comes after this. You know, I think the the media right now is in a, in a transition, a, a, a transition period here potentially where you have some people arguing, you know, that the age of objective, so-called objective journalism is over and, and we need to just have advocacy journalism and everything needs to be like Fox or MSNBC. And um, I hope it doesn't, I, I hope it doesn't go down that road. Um, I, I hope that some of these, you know, mainstream media outlets still try to sort of although not perfectly, but tried to do more of an objective, he said, he said she said, sort of reporting. Um, but, you know, there, there are challenges to that. And, um, but I, you know, I would just try to tell people, and, and what I do in, in the book is uh, say, try to do a content, have, have a friend or a family member cut out some articles and take off the, you know, the identifying marks and, and see. And, and it really is... Um, and I see this happen with my students and people when, you know, when I do workshops, even with, with adults and, uh, and give them these exercises, it really is enlightening. Um, and it sort of turns, I guess, the mirror back on ourselves and say, okay, well, maybe I'm, I'm bringing something to the table as well here. Uh, so that's a really long, circuitous answer. Um, and, I, and I can't give you an answer to your specific question you know about particular instances but um i i do think it's something that we always need to be worried about and we always need the media to sort of be self-reflecting on this um but i it's it's 
it's tough. It's a tough yeah. job. And uh, um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I'm not, not trying to challenge all your ideas or anything, but but you know, it's like your your ideas for individuals. You know, I'm just worried that um, individuals can't hear a lot of things if they're listening to the big media companies because I believe they're kind of captured potentially. Um, so how do we get to individuals to hear this kind of thing? Like you know, we could uh, we used to put all of our uh, uh, episodes on YouTube, right? And um, we put some of it on YouTube now. But if we put this on YouTube, I don't believe enough people will get to it because of the algorithm. Because right. unless we're you know, I could go like, all right, Tim. It looks like the majority of your book is blue, so <laughs> that must mean, you know, uh, other other than us fighting, I don't know if the algorithm is going to show this to a lot of uh, people watching YouTube, you know. So the, I just worry about those kind of problems, um, you know. And and for context, really quick, we should mention we're talking on August fourth, twenty twenty three. Cause you were talking about Trump's uh, indict in, uh, being You're indicted. Right with the third one, I believe this week. Right. So, right. Uh, that, that's, that's, um, I'm almost glad to hear what you said there about that, what you're looking, you're doing with that Trump indictment story, uh, just this week. And you're, it, you're finding the same example where people can't figure out where it's coming from. So that's, that's good to hear. Yeah. And, and to be clear, you know, and again, this, this is, um, and this has become harder when people don't read, physical copies of newspapers anymore or mm. um, but you know this is just the you know the front page story but you also have to look at it's not an, an, an analysis right newspapers have columns that people analyze the news of the day and some more uh, bias can creep in there this is not editorializing where obviously bias is supposed to be there these are your straight reporting news source, you know, that are on the front page or the front, you know, the first couple pages in the newspaper. And, the, and those tend to be pretty straightforward, you know, reporting of the facts. Here's what this side says. Here's what that side says. Um, and again, even, you know, on, on some of these when I've done this and, and students kind of it's like, oh, my gosh, they gave the Democrats 13 lines and they gave the Republicans 13 lines. Like, obviously, someone is counting. Right when they're when they're doing this, when they're putting this story together, um, to you know to make sure that there's a balance there. Um, but I think, as to your point about information sources, I always encourage everybody. Um, you, you have to have a diverse media diet, and um, agreed. And yeah. that that can include like there, there's a there's a place for Fox News and there's a place for MSNBC, uh, you know, to have those opinions out there and, and people expressing those. You just have to understand where those are coming from, uh, understand because too, too many people watch those programs and they think that that's the straightforward news reporting. Um, we, I, I mentioned that when we look at an, a, an objective piece of reporting, we tend to think it's biased against our party. Yeah. And that's called the hostile media effect. There's, but what they've also found is when we watch a program that agrees with us, if it's an opinion program, we tend to find it factual. And so a lot of people will watch MSNBC or Fox at, at night and they'll think that they're watching a news program when it's just it's really like watching an editorial program. Sean Hannity, Rachel Maddow, they're not journalists. They're commentators and it's very different. And as long as you know that, um, that's OK. You can listen to you know what they're saying and uh, agree with it or disagree with it. But as long as you understand they're commenting on the news of the day, just like if you're reading an editorial, if we understand those things, there's a place for all of it. Um, but we have to have a diverse diet where if, you know, we're, we're consuming some of the, the opinionated stuff, but maybe from both sides. But then we're, you know, we're also reading some of the more straightforward news reports and things like that. Uh, and unfortunately, like, that's not necessarily happening today. Um, or we're just reading headlines. I, I think it is troubling that, you know, a lot of 
was mentioning the the mainstream media is in a transition phase now that they're trying to survive in in the digital age and i think it's bad that they're um you know a lot of their headlines are are being written by people that are just trying to get clicks you know so they're using yeah. more emotional language or whatever and even if that's not necessarily reflected in the rest of the story they're they're trying to generate clicks because that's what generates revenue now and and so it's it's an it's a definitely a new media environment and we're going to see have to see how it shakes out uh but i'm i'm hoping and this sort of goes back to what we were talking about before things being driven by voices uh on the extremes that i i hope we don't lose that mainstream media that is that has tried to be more objective and has had these standards to to try to be fair minded when it came to this sort of thing uh and they don't and they don't just see that well the only way to make money is by either being to the left or to the right and so choose your side and here we go uh i i think that would ultimately be detrimental yeah i agree and then um we're getting close to an hour here so maybe one of the last questions um and this connects with the solutions in your book. Um, how do you think it's going with the solutions? Is it helping people? Because what are your thoughts on the 2024 elections with those people? Like like you said, Trump's facing multiple indict indict indictments and we're still he's still leading the polls for a Republican nomination. We have Robert F. Kennedy Jr. as a major challenger, challenger to Biden, yet it appears as though the DNC may uh, stifle his efforts to be a challenger. How do you see that election unfolding? Do you think things like your book can be solutions enough to help people make different decisions potentially in 2024 to help themselves and help their their community, you know, like they should be focusing on? Well, uh, I wish my book could be so influential. Uh, you know, it's it's a uh, it's my contribution, and it's a very small contribution. Um, you know, the feedback that I've gotten has has been very positive uh, from from people, and which I think is great. But there's a lot of groups out there that you you know you mentioned Braver Angels is just one of them. But there are so many groups out there who are working on this, and um, you know, it's it's these small changes, right, that will take place, and I. I hope that I, I think, you know, and, and again, my, you know, my, the, the, the book doesn't tell you who to vote for. It doesn't take a partisan stance. Right. Every, I, I give a, for every ex example of a Republican, I use an example of a Democrat and vice versa, uh, because I want people of all partisan persuasions to, to read it. Um, cause I, I mentioned in the forward, this isn't a democratic problem or Republican problem. It's a human problem. And, uh, it's, it's, we, we all exhibit these characteristics. And so I, um, you know, there's been so much great research out there and I, I wanted to get it out to people and hope that people will, will read it and say, you know what, I, I do this. I do this all the time. Maybe I, I do need to have more conversations. Maybe I do need to think about what I'm reading. Um, maybe I do need to think about how I evaluate information or perceive information, but this is really challenging stuff. I mean, you, you can't overcome it. It's like an optical illusion. You, you could be aware that it's an optical illusion, but you can't unsee it. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you can look at train tracks and know that they don't touch, but they look like they do. And, and you know that they don't, but all, they still look like they do. We have these biases and you can become aware of it they're still going to inflict you on a daily basis. And I, I struggle with this stuff constantly on a daily basis, yeah. uh, constantly working at this, making sure that I'm, I'm trying to be more fair minded and, and, you know, okay, well this side saying this, wh what are they saying on this side? And it has helped me. Um, and uh, it's changed some of my behavior, some of my, my thinking. And so it, you know, uh, but I, I hope, I don't know for 2024, you know, um, but I, I, I think we're in the process. I'm optimistic in the long run. I think a lot of this is, is new. We're, we're in a new media environment. Uh, we're in a new political environment. 
But again, I think there are a lot of people of goodwill who on both sides of the aisle who are troubled by the vitriol that, that we see. And there's a lot of people who don't like it and want to fix it and still have spirited, emotional, heartfelt political disagreements where, where people are arguing and advocating for what they believe is right and arguing for what they believe is just but doing so in, in a manner in which we're sharing this political space with our fellow citizens. And you know, this was what, what, the, what the framers and what the founders understood that in a country that is so large uh, and so diverse, you know, the, the people who were arguing against the creation of the United States, um, some of the anti-federals, for example, were advocating that th this isn't gonna work. It's, it's yeah. too big, it's too diverse. Uh, whereas Madison was arguing, no, we, we can make it work. And this is what Lincoln was talking about at Gettysburg, you know, can a nation so conceived endure? And that's what this work is about. It's about, can we actually have a nation where people disagree in a democratic society where, where we can live with each other and we can compromise and we can still fight the good fight, trying to convince our fellow citizens that we're right and they're wrong and they're trying to convince us that they're right and we're wrong but but do so in a way uh that that we can find a way to all live together and um and that's why i think this work is so important and i think there's a lot of good people doing this work i don't know if it will take root by 2024 but i hope that you know we're planting seeds that we'll be able to harvest in the future and that things will get better I agree, and I hope that as well. And um, that's what we're trying to do. If we can, if every episode gets to one person and gets them to think differently, then then I believe that's that's what we're that's great for what we're trying to do here, right? Because that's exactly we'll show it again what you're trying to do here. How hyper partisan partisanship dumbs down democracy and how to fix it. So that hyper partisanship ship is that's what you're trying to fix here. Right. And um, yeah, I believe that everybody should buy your book that we talked about, talk to here. Well, thank yeah. you so much, Toby. Thanks for the uh, opportunity to come and speak. Yeah, I appreciate the time. Um, you can tell there's so much thought uh, and and that goes into this. Um, how long did it? even take to write the book and put this all together yeah years and years uh it, sort yeah. of an organic process i i uh wrote columns um for a newspaper uh, mm. about politics and critical thinking and a lot of positive feedback on that then i started some writing some longer form articles and then uh, i had an an author um who writes a lot about critical thinking contact me and say you know you really need to write a book and so um once i all together, really sort yeah. of got into it uh it was about um two years i would i would say you know um, i had a lot of the research already done but it was you know putting it all together compiling it and writing it it's a time-consuming process and got two little kids and so that but i got a wonderful wife who uh really it it is a uh it really does take a <laughs> A lot of people, so it's not just the one the one person writing it. You know, I needed uh, a really strong support system. I have a wonderful family, wonderful in laws, and that that enabled me to spend time to go into my office and just write while they were taking care of the kids. And so it it's it's a lot, yeah, but it's a passion, and and uh, and people have found it uh, to be a worthwhile effort, and that that makes it all worth it. Yeah, that's good. So it's it's your part of your tribe that helped you uh, yes. get this done, right? That's, that's right. Kind of funny to say it that way, almost. Yeah, yeah. And so you talked about working on another book. Is there anything you want to mention about that and how people can uh, find you? Uh, you can find me on. Well, I was going to say Twitter. Now it's X, I guess. Uh, yeah, right. At at T J Redmo, um, T J R E D M O, and uh, that's really my only social media. Um, and I, yes, yeah, so I'm just starting to put together an outline for the book, but it's, it's going to be sort of a spinoff of my, my first chapter. I'm, I'm going to talk about, uh, some of the things I was mentioning, a lot of the misperception, um, that members of each party have about each other. And then the negative ramifications of that, which I sort of get into in chapter one about how we 
segregate ourselves from members of the other party. We discriminate against them. You know, uh, we even dehumanize them and so on. And so talk about that. And then also how we can correct these perceptions and, and the salubrious effects that that has on, on politics. So it's definitely related, uh, but it's more not so much critical thinking. It's just about really obviously some critical thinking in there, but it's more, yeah. more about the misperceptions we have of other other parties rather than this book really is like inward reflection on how you think about politics. Okay. Okay. We'll uh, look out for you then and watch for that book to come out. Um, right. Probably hope to have you back on to talk about that book when it does come out. Um, unless you're too big for us and then you're no. on, you know, <laughs> you're talking to, uh, you're down in Austin talking to Joe, yeah. right? I, and uh, <laughs> I don't think you have to worry about that. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, but otherwise, yeah, we'll, we'll have you on. That'd be great. Um, great. And uh, yeah, we'll put links to your Twitter and to uh, to Amazon or wherever you want us to to have people buy you. your book and the show yeah, descriptions. Okay. And uh, yeah, best of luck. And thanks for coming on again. Tim Redmond, everybody. Yeah. Thanks. All right. We'll, uh, we'll see everyone next time. Thank you.